Facebook is not the devil. You know? If I Facebook at work, it's for a purpose, mostly. And when it's not, it's my 10-minute break. Don't go get on my back. How many of you have ever had people on your staffs going at each other on these kinds of issues? Those old farts just don't get it. Those kids don't have a clue what's going on, and they need to put in their time in order to get ahead in this company. <coughs> Heard that? What we're going to talk about today, go over this way. I walk a lot, so this is going to be challenging. Um, what we're going to talk about today is some tools for your toolbox. I like to joke that this is the presentation where you're not going to learn a lot of new stuff. You're going to hear stuff you already know and hopefully put it together in some ways that will be useful for you as you um, interact with different generations. Talking about what we're going to do is the structure of it is we're going to talk about each generation, what shaped them, what that looks like in the workplace. Then we're going to talk about the intersection of those. And you know the golden rule? You know, somebody tell me what the golden rule is. That's, I'm a grant writer, so that is my key golden rule. Know the original one. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. I'd ask you to forget that. What I think you should do is actually do unto others as they wish to be done to. Keep that in mind as we go through this. If more millennials actually wrote a formal email to their baby boomer bosses and requested a meeting, that would work better than poking in the door and going, as I actually heard one of my AmeriCorps do one time, dude, where's the meeting? To the executive director. Wasn't here in Abingdon, but still. But it would also be helpful if baby boomers learned how to pick up their phones at the end of a great day or project and go, Way to go, nice job on the presentation. Take the rest of the afternoon off via text. Do unto others as they would like you to. In both cases, goes a lot further than here's the way to do things. So think about that as we go through. Um, you have uh, some printouts. I also am happy to share this presentation. No restrictions, no rights, no nothing. Um, if you think it would be useful, I'll send it to you. So if you don't feel like taking detailed notes or if you can't read the charts, just um, Sandy already has a link to it. You can just share the Dropbox link or write to me. Actually, I'm, you can note on the evaluation form if you want it, and then we'll just send it to you. Jennifer and myself will. Sure. And so I'm happy to have you use it, but I can also, we can send you the actual PowerPoint, not just the slides. We'll send you the PowerPoint deck, and you can use it, you know, in more places. If you find things useful, change it up. Um, no, no restrictions. So with that, generations at work. This is really the first time in history, and some interesting things have happened in 2015, that there have been five generations entering and leaving the workplace, but all at the same time. We're going to talk first about the traditionalist to the silent generation, not because there are a tremendous number left in the workforce, though there are some, but because of how they shaped the baby boomers, which has shaped our modern workplace. We're going to talk about uh, the boomers themselves, who are now no longer the largest numbers in the workforce. The millennials surpassed them this spring. And we Gen Xers never were on top, never were going to be on top, are on top now. We're, we're the only ones. The millennials Gen out, of course, and then Gen 2020, which is the kids um, who are coming into the workforce now, who are in high school and college, coming in late teens, early 20s, and what that's going to look like. I don't have a terribly specific section on that because as sociologists and psychologists and workplace uh, folks are saying, they're not really there yet in force. We don't know. What we do know is they're going to be a little bit different than the millennials. Think of them as millennials on speed. Um, so we're not going to do as much in depth on that. So generation gaps. This is not a new complaint. I use American Pie because that's the song that you know, came out, of course, in the 60s, and everyone dined out on what the heck is a good old boy. We Southerners, of course, knew that from the beginning. What does that song mean? What are they talking about, right? People were talking about this. Generation complainings have been around for a very long time in the media. The Romans probably said, those young gladiators, they just don't do things the way that we did in the ring. It's not the same. <laughs> this is a universal discussion. What's new for us, especially in a workplace sense, is that this is the first time that we've had so many generations in the workplace at once. 
technology, as we all know, has moved very, very, very quickly in the last 30, 40 years. And that has made these gaps more apparent than they were in earlier generations, right? Because you're having kids coming in with technology skills that I'm just in awe of, you know, um, that I'm pretty technologically savvy, as are most people I think probably here in the room. So, traditionalists. Most of these are our grandparents, in some cases our parents. Um, every generation has its music, so also to keep it lively. But music, movies, books, I'm walking up above the sight line again, aren't I? Um, I don't like being this far from all of you. So, but music, films, they both shape us as generations, but we shape them. Right? They, ref they both <coughs> reflect us and we create them. So the kinds of music that were going on in the World War II era. It's also called the silent generation. Born before 1946, 60s to 80s. Anybody have any traditionalists in their workforce still? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we do a community action. I'll, I should say I'm a People Incorporated, and I am the Director of Program Development. I think I skipped that part. Um, this is actually not part of my job there. This is sort of like a vacation from grant writing. Um, but I was the Director of Training for the National Network for several years and developed this in the course of doing um, So defining events, we all have them. This is the generation. Anybody's parents or grandparents say string? Rubber bands? Fold it brown paper? Because they never knew what was coming. Use it up, make it do or do without. This is a generation who didn't waste anything because they knew they couldn't afford to. Interestingly, there are some emerging parallels with the younger millennials who have seen their parents go through the Great Recession, lose jobs, lose retirement, lose their savings. All the way through that, there's some interesting parallels beginning to emerge in those two things. History does, in fact, repeat itself. Stock market collapse. How many people remember their parents or grandparents not trusting the bank or the stock markets? I put my money either in a savings account or under the bed or in the barn or whatever it is. Yeah. And the A-bomb. Danger is an important part of generational shaping. For this generation, the biggest dangers were over there. Right? The bombs were over there. The fighting was over there. It didn't touch us. <coughs> this is being recorded, um, I, I learned. So this is why I have to keep coming back here. So it will be available to you. So just absorb. Don't worry too much about note taking. If you can, enjoy lunch and just sort of absorb and, and pull this together for yourselves. General characteristics of this generation. Think about the folks you know, 60s to 80s. And I want to emphasize as we start the each generation, these are generalizations. Okay? <laughs> you will find 70-year-olds who are none of these things. Of course you will. <laughs> but as a group, these are the characteristics you would you would often see. So, reliable, for <coughs> patriotic in a very traditional way. You know, this generation would no more leave their hat on during the singing of the national anthem. I watched somebody at the fireworks show down at the Bristol Dragway whack one of their grown kids who was holding their grandchild and whack the cap off his head. <laughs> you know, it's like this is a generation that takes that very seriously. Not that others don't, but as a generation, this does too. Respectful. This is a very rule-adherent generation. That's the way it works. You put in your time, you get your gold watch, right? You retire with a pension and life is good. You kind of look at that in terms of life in general. Strong set of moral obligations, very hardworking. <clears throat> sun up to sundown, you know, at the end of the day. How does that translate into workplace behaviors? It's really the question. Loyal to their employers. This is a generation that pretty much worked as a career for a company. Because okay? companies could be counted on to be there for their careers. Effective and warm interpersonal skills. This is the generations before social media, telephones, television sets. This is front porch visiting. This is folks who are generally very good one-to-one. -one. Work ethic, timeliness, and putting in the hours. You're on time, you put in your day, you go home. Very well to learn. Actually, they do pretty well with modern technology and stuff, if you can who <coughs> will do it, that it tends to work very nicely. But they accept a command and control management style, because that's what it was then, right? That was top-down, work charts were very vertical. Here's what we're going to do, here's how we're going to do it. Okay. 
I'm seeing not, because this, this is obviously resonating already. <laughs> baby boomers, on the other hand. And by the way, for those of you who are baby boomers, and most, eh, probably a good half in here are baby boomers, I'm guessing, the current workplace of today is our fault. We shaped it. We grew it. We insisted on it. We also insisted how education was going to run. With our kids, who was, well, actually, I was born on the first day of Gen X, actually, January 1st. Uh, baby Boomers, Turn Through the Grapevine, uh, Big Chill Movie, who remembers it? It's one of the ultimate ba baby boomer films, like coming back together. Out of Hanukkah? <laughs> there was bad acid in the 60s. And now there's bad assets. My retirement account. Oh, my retirement account. <laughs> Yuppies were coined. So these are folks who are in their very early 50s. As I said, I am 50, and I was born January 1st of 65. That is the official day after the baby boom ended, December 31st, 1964. Um, so I call myself a exer with the baby boom rising. <laughs> Defining events. Think about what happened for them. This is the era of civil rights. The King and Kennedy, and both Kennedys actually, are of these assassination as well. People know where they were when those things happened. They shaped us as a generation. Woodstock, despite the fact that there were only, you know, a few tens of thousands of people there, shaped an entire generation in terms of music, in terms of questioning authority. The whole civil rights feminist movements came out of this era. This is seen, whether we like it or not, the greatest social change pretty much ever in history over a short period of time happened in these years. TV and the Cold War. So the first generation, the war was over there. You know, you wrote letters to your, um, thank you, Sandy. You wrote letters to your boys and women over there, and weeks later, you'd get a response back. Vietnam is now in your living room at dinner. It's still over there, but it's much closer to home. We're seeing the violence, we're seeing the protests. Right, when Johnny came marching home after World War II, in general, Johnny was not met with protesters and horrible conditions at home and things going bad. Um, very, very different time. It's now much closer to us. We're now dealing, we begin to deal with the first fallout. There was always PTSD going on for our veterans. But now we finally begin to have a name for it other than shell shock and he just needs a rest. Right? We recognize that this shapes people in ways that are very hard and very difficult. What does it look like at work, though? Think about the workplaces that we know now, other than the ones that are already moving into the next generation with tearing down everything and putting everybody in bullpens for ideas. Okay, think about our sort of traditional workplaces, cubicles, corner offices, the way it generally works. It's the baby boomers. Optimistic and driven, but they are used to being the focus of attention. Um, their parents were right there. They were the last generation that had parents typically at home. Now, this is generally only true for middle class kind of an, uh, people in poverty. That's what I do for a living is work with that population. Traditionally had everybody working because you had to. Some of these things will still hold true. Others, not so much. But the whole uh, <coughs> Beaver method, the Leave it to Beaver family, um, all that came out of this era, that idealized version of having mom home after school to give you cookies, that kind of thing. It comes from here. They want their opinion to count, because it did. Right? They were a larger generation than their parents, and they are very used to being that focus. They do value individuality. They're not called the me generation for nothing. They are also, or I should say we are all also, for all the television ads for every anti-aging product around. <laughs> You know the ones I mean, the ones that show the happy couple going through the field hand in hand and you're not sure if it's for uh, sexual dysfunction drugs or allergy meds. <laughs> you know, we're talking about daisies or love, what are we talking about here? Um, yeah, you know, those wonderful ads with women now talking about how it's okay to need help with, you know, our personal lives. Because this generation is not going gently into <coughs> older age. This, in, in, the, in the traditionalist generation, you were, the elders were revered, right? Grandma and Grandpa were the head of the table still. The baby boomers take over, and they do not want to age gracefully. Well, they do want to age gracefully. They don't want to age at all. 60 is the new 30. Right, that's the boomers. I can tell you at 50, it's not the new 30. Enjoy it now while you're done. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. They want to have it all, and they're trying hard. Workplace behaviors. Yuppies again. Work comes first. 
How many of you remember parents who missed ball games and stuff because they had a meeting and the office expected that they would be there? Family life was set. Work-life balance, not a conversation piece at this point. It is now, and that's one of the big changes, and this is why. Work ethic, it's still about working long hours, working hard, being observed doing it. Who can think of the folks who are happy to work late, but they always seem to be able to send an email at nine o'clock at night when they're working, just so you know they're still doing it. How many of us do it who are not necessarily boomers to show our boomer folks that we're on it? Even though I took off, I've been gone for the week, you know, caring for an empty parent, I'm on my email, I got it going on, right? Being observed doing it is a big part of the ethos for baby boomers. Don't mind working hard, but you kind of want credit for it now. It's part of the B generation. There's a big focus though on teamwork, relationship building. You know when we have talked about kids not being able to do anything individually, like they have to, they sort of move in herds now? Do you remember your kids in kindergarten and grade school boomers? Every project's a group project. We want them to, to work in groups. It used to be we did your assignments alone. Education model also moved to a group model. We trained the millennials and some of the later Gen Xers to work in groups. We put them in school and we said, work with these six people on the project. Introverts hated that, by the way. And high performers typically didn't like it because there was always somebody on the group who wasn't holding their weight. Sound like team models in the workplace, right? Same problem, different stage of life. We built this system um, to do that. So we have to take some ownership for that. <coughs> Work hard to advance and put in your time. Um, if I could make that <coughs> purple and large right now, I would. This is the biggest kicker right here <coughs> that causes boomers and millennials to butt heads. <coughs> and neither one is wrong and neither one is right. It is how they look at it, though. A boomer wants you, you put in your time here and you'll get to lead a project when you've been here for a few years. A millennial says, yeah, but I've got this. I'm capable, which in most cases they are. Turn me loose, let me do it. Here's the problem. Millennials now form a bigger part of the workforce than boomers. And whether you retire one way or another, you are going to lead the workforce. Someday, and younger ones are going to take over. It's been happening since Adam and Eve. And it is going to happen. The question is, how is it going to happen this time? But this is the biggest sticking point. And if you are in an environment where you need millennial employees, which we do, I'm assuming you do, you know, to take over, to come in, new ideas, new blood, replace retirees, all that, if you tell them that this is how you're going to manage the company in the future. You put in your time, you see head shaking, they will leave. They will go somewhere else. And they will take their not inconsiderable talents with them. Um, we are figuring that out our way too. We work under a whole lot of government programs where there isn't always a lot of wiggle room. And we're having to find ways to be creative in order to keep these gifted and wonderful folks because they are not going to put up with it. So your question is, is not how do we make them do it our way? The question is, is how do we balance? You need some experience, but you also need some room to grow and, and do your projects and go get ahead in the company without necessarily being here for five or 10 years or whatever the current culture is. So I teach this from a pragmatic standpoint. The rights and wrongs of they should just learn to do this or they should just get over it isn't really what I worry about. I deal with the situation as it is in front of me. Um, there's this big old saying, though, you can't change uh, attitudes. You can only change behaviors. Attitudes will either come or they won't. Wake up. Gen X. The one, the only, the immortal prince. 1999. Everybody remember that all the companies that made a fortune off of us, telling us everything from our coffee pots to our servers were going to go down mm -hmm. at the millennium? Banks, especially. Any bankers in the room? I was in, I was in banking when that health care was going on. Oh, a tiny community bank, Kalispell, Montana. I think we spent two hundred thousand dollars to ensure the problem that we had didn't happen. People, a lot of people retired on that on that case. So, also called the post boomers, the MTV generation. I was in high school. Some of you all were too. The day MTV went live in the eighties. Video Killed the Radio Star was the other song I considered for this one. Mm -hmm. right? 
Um, born between 65 and 76, 30s to very late 40s, or for the occasional one of us, the very beginning of our 50s. <clears throat> our defining events, the Challenger explosion. You know, we were children of the space race. We don't remember a time when we didn't have people in space or had had people in space, right? The walk on the moon was a baby boomer deal. The Challenger explosion, sending people up was ours, <clears throat> knowing where you were. STDs, uh, AIDS, drugs. In the 60s, free love, free sex, good drugs, right? It was for fun. Now we have AIDS and drugs can kill you. As we've learned now to our very great sorrow with club drugs and things. <clears throat> now, sex and drugs isn't just recreational anymore. Actually, if anyone's following statistics, the millennials have had the lowest rates of teen pregnancies that we've seen since the baby boomers. They've learned this. They know this because Gen Xers experienced it and have taught them. And there are still 50,000 new cases of AIDS. We just heard Charlie Sheen go live yesterday. Yesterday? The day before? Come out as HIV positive. Right? Things happen. But we know this now. So people are more cautious. Energy crisis. Anybody remember their parents in line for gas, complaining about gas prices through the roof? <clears throat> Energy crisis for the home, for poor people, propane. A lot of people went back to wood burning couldn't afford gas. Computers, and this is a key. And who remembers uh, being in a school that did not have a computer lab? Okay, keep your hands up. How many of you were, in were somewhere in school when the computer lab was installed? Mm -hmm. yeah. We are the kernel of the Gen Xers. We're the ones who saw it coming in. Just as we never knew a time when we didn't have people in space or orbiting satellites or things, the millennials, which I'm going to assume you guys are at least, um, my teaching tools. <laughs> you guys are. I have everybody. Um, yep. Thank you for all being here. All my experience. <laughs> um, the millennials don't know a time without computers. To them, the original Star Trek episodes where you talk into your communicator, you know, beam me up, Mr. Scott, um, is a reality, right? They've never had a time when they couldn't click a button on their phone. Nanny's wearing an Apple Watch. Now she actually can talk to her wrist, just like in the original show. <laughs> and it communicates. I want one of those. Um, badly. So you guys are, have never seen a world without computers. We saw them come in. We saw the trash I'm 80. I'm Gen X right here. So. <coughs> perfect. I'm just saying. So. See, perfect. But, and we are frequently the interpreters of the Gen Xers, to the, of the Millennials to the Boomers, and the Boomers to the Millennials. We are frequently the middle manager who says, please, please don't quit. Please don't quit. <laughs> We're going to help make this better for you. Please don't fire the kid for having been on Facebook when you walked in the office because, you know, hey, these things happen. And either it's a break or they're communicating. I communicate with my staff on Facebook. I tweet compliments. You know, there's a reason for it. True story. Um, we, at one point, my mistake, had a NeighborWorks paint stay the agency. Uh, again, Kalispell, Montana, before I came back east. And I mistook the date. Had the press <coughs> lined up, it was going to be gorgeous. Put the wrong date on the press release. Didn't have any volunteers. It was going to be the next day. Could not tell the camera person and the reporter who were showing up that would have, you know, that would have looked bad. Had my head in my hands when my AmeriCorps Vista walked in the room and said, what's going on? We're going? I said, yeah, we haven't got anybody. She's like, really? Oh, well, I can fix that. <coughs> And she got on Facebook and issued a call to every AmeriCorps Vista in the entire western part of Montana. Within two hours, I had 15 fresh-faced, charming young people wearing NeighborWorks shirts painting a house. I never again doubted the power of social media <laughs> to help my mission. But that's how we purchase things now, right? How many of you go on Yelp to check out a restaurant or a hotel when you're traveling? I do. How many of you use peer recommendations? This is not just a millennial thing. The millennials taught us about the power of we're all using it too. So the computers. Now the last thing about the Gen Xers that's important is latchkey kids. <coughs> we were the first generation that it was typical not to have a parent at home when you got home from school. So as a result, we tend to be pretty independent. We tend to be fairly balanced. Again, tendencies are generalizations, not universal truths. It also depends on the day. Adaptable, cautiously optimistic, but a little skeptical and hesitant sometimes. We've seen an awful lot of change, and then we're kind of embroiled in it. We also, for the most part, had baby boomer parents, who 
who have spent a lot of time bemoaning those kids. But we tend to be very comfortable with technology. Now, here's the key. Comfortable with technology and born with it in our hands <laughs> are two very different things. <clears throat> we were joking earlier, it's like I'm stuck on a PC now and I'm not happy about it. And then things, well, why not just get an iPad, you know, do it on the iPad with Keynote and control it from your watch? Not a typical Xer or Boomer, but wonderful to see. <laughs> Usually it would be somebody else saying that, but there are always exceptions. Our workplace behaviors. We heard stories about our grandparents as Xers. We saw our parents in the boomers. I watched my dad get ousted from Alieska Pipeline, you know, over the years of all the cuts and everything. And yes, there are golden parachutes for higher ups, but not for most people. And we watched them, it doesn't work anymore. So we work to live. We don't work, live to work anymore as a generation. We want that work-life balance. This is when these conversations first started happening. Um, is really with this generation. The end of the baby boom and into here is, hey, I'm willing to give you all my efforts and my professional self, but at the end of the day, I want to go home and have a life. I'm not going to stay plugged in all night. I'm not going to do it. We raise the millennials to be even more so. So work ethic is a little bit different. Getting the job done right, getting the job done well, and getting it done fast. Being seen doing it, unless we have a baby boomer watching over our shoulders, we tend not to care. I got the project finished on time, so guess what? I'm going to take off early on Friday because I got it done. All right, that was the deadline this week. I'll pick up next week, but I'm finished. Now, that doesn't work in a lot of traditional workplaces, and it doesn't work a lot with, with hourly employees. How do we balance that is one of our key questions. We value talent and ability over longevity. In other words, if you could do the job, get it done, get it done right, we want you on our teams. Um, just because you're a senior manager who's been there 15 years, if you're one of the people who says, well, that's the way we've always done things, I'm not interested in having you on my team. I don't want to spend any time on that if I can help it. The reality is, is we all have to help it. We all have to work with the different generations. So that's where the building tolerance up comes in. Was that a question or a stretch? Because I, really I really am open to comments, questions. Yay, sister, that's not how it looks where I am. <laughs> you appear to be awake, so I'm not a person. <coughs> All right. We tend to be loyal to a person as opposed to a job or an employer. If we find a terrific manager in our industry and they wander off, we may well wander off with them um, as a generation. <laughs> seems to have been the label that was settled on in general. 77 and 97. <coughs> so we're looking at people 34 and younger. So the boomers, Vietnam was in the living room. The Gen Xers, it was the Cold War. Think about who were the bad guys during the Cold War in the movies. What accents did they have? Russian. Specter, Mr. Bond. Well, now Specter's out again, and that was a great movie if you haven't seen it. Spectre, Mr. Bond. Yeah, we are, you know, all the bad guys had Russian accents, right? You know, white guy with Russian accents. Um, this generation, Columbine, terrorists are now primarily either Middle Eastern or now homegrown. We didn't, we knew we weren't safe overseas. A lot of traditionalists died in wars. Right? A lot of the baby boomers died in Vietnam and Korea. But the violence was always somewhere else. The millennials are the first generation for whom not only are you not safe in the Twin Towers, you're not safe in high school. You're not safe at the Boston Marathon. Now you're not safe having dinner in Paris. Right? This is the generation that does not assume it is safe anywhere. <coughs> and despite that, they are possibly the most optimistic generation in the periods we've been discussing. As a generation, they are. They value freedom and autonomy. They are donating to charities worldwide, local and worldwide, at the highest levels in history, given their incomes. 
They give of their time, they give of their talents, they give of their money. They are amazing. I sound like I'm in love with the millennial generation I am. Yay! Yay! <laughs> they're smart, they're flexible. They do actually like immediate gratification, however. And how did they come by that liking? Think about what we've been what I've been talking about. They were taught. Baby boomers like immediate gratification too. You don't think Amazon was fueled by millennials, do you? No, it was fueled by my parents ordering everything under the sun on Amazon. Who's the first prime member, I think? Um, you know, it's like, bring it on, bring it to me, bring it now, I want it. But our culture has trained millennials to love instant gratification. In school, what did we do when people had sports meets? In this generation, everybody gets a prize, right? Um, that's not necessarily good or bad, my own personal feelings aside. We have trained as kids to want praise and to want gratification in very concrete, specific ways. We have taught whole courses on raising kids' self-esteem, which is a good thing, but now we have the fallout, which is, I'm smart enough. Or what, what, what's the line in the movie? I'm good enough, I'm smart enough, and doggone it, people like me. <laughs> um, this is true. But it's true, you have to find ways to deal with it. Again, it is not about good and bad. It is about the very real fact that if you want skilled and talented millennial employees, you have to find ways to give them what they want while still getting what you want. Yeah. While still getting a good day's performance out of everybody. They tend to relate really well to traditionalists and older boomers. Interestingly enough, there's a surprising amount in common <coughs> with having seen economic failures, meltdowns, parents laid off through no fault of their own, plants closing, the ball plant, you know, closing down here in a little bit in Bristol. You know, a friend of mine's husband who was a boomer has worked there for 30 some years and he's going away. He's got a life here. You don't want to move to another ball plant somewhere else. These kids have grown up seeing that. So they're not interested in that. They're interested in making a difference. They're really interested, feel free to chime in, agree or disagree, in knowing what the big picture is. One of the things that we tended to do as Xers and Boomers is compartmentalize projects. Well, you guys have the budget piece, and you guys are gonna work on the staffing piece, and you guys are gonna work on this. People now, and it makes more sense at the pace of the global economy, they wanna know what the big picture is and what their piece of it means. You know, doesn't it work better if at the beginning of a project you bring everyone together and say, okay, yes, here's the team and we're, you're, you are going to do the budget, you are going to do HR, but here's how it's all going to come together. Okay? That's the sort of tactic and technique that works pretty well with millennials. Uh, and boomers like meetings. We Gen Xers usually have to be drugged into a meeting, kicking and screaming, and be told that it's actually going to have an outcome. <laughs> I, I think that Please. meeting the big picture, it also ties into we're the question askers, mm -hmm. and we don't want to know for me, I don't want to just be told to do something. I want to know why am I doing it. So that's why we like to see the big pictures. Because if I just have a small piece of the pie, I don't really know why I'm doing this and how it affects the rest of the pie. Mm -hmm. Which can lead to doing a better job in addition to satisfying your need to know how it fits. The model of the boomer workplace, think of like IBM in the 80s, you know, kind of mutual of America, you know, kind of the big standard between us. The model was here is your desk, here is your job, you do this. That's it. That model widely now. Oh, in by the way, you had to wear navy suits. Hmm? Yeah. You had to wear navy suits. Oh, God. Did you actually work there? My aunt did. <laughs> yeah, she, she had this wonderful collection of navy suits. It was, yeah, it was awful. Um, it's like, you're going to do that, at least let you wear scrubs for heaven's sakes or something. <laughs> um, it's uncomfortable. But this is the way those workforces grew. Now, we are seeing madly, if you read Forbes or Inc. Met or Inc. Uh, online, you are seeing that, on balance, even the big old standard companies are exploring changing up their work groups. It's not just the tech companies with their ball pits and their pool tables, <laughs> you know, who are doing this. Very mainstream companies are starting to experiment now with vacation on demand. As long as your job is done and you and your manager agree, take off all the time you want to. There are big Fortune 500 companies trying this out now and saying, okay, you know, we'll, we'll move, we'll figure it out. And it works well some places, it doesn't work well other places. One of the things that we ch are challenged with, and you probably are too, is some of our jobs lend themselves to, I'm out of here on Friday afternoon, but a frontline position interacting with the public, it's not the case, right? We need our receptionist in place. We need our 
home visitors out in the field doing their thing. You probably need your salespeople, you know, online. You need folks answering the phones. So one of, and that's one of the questions. I'm answering a question that hasn't been asked yet, which is what do we do when the job itself doesn't permit that kind of flexibility? One is you post it, you, you make sure that people know that's the job. This particular job is 8 to 5, Monday to Friday, and here's why. Mm -hmm. And you say, and this is a stepping stone to other things. You want that flexibility? Great. Well, we have other roles where that is part of the deal. Right? Fair treatment isn't always equal treatment. You know, and if somebody goes into it saying, yeah, this job is this, and yes, my colleague, I'm going to make it up now, okay? You took a job and you came in and you're the, you know, the front office person and switchboard and you're handling everything and you're busy as you can do. And you just graduated to a client position, you don't have any appointments Friday. Right? <coughs> as long as you have explained to these guys that the role I hired you for, or I'm hiring you for, if this has to happen at the hiring discussion, is this. And this is the expectation. They will typically be okay with it. It's when you spring that on people after the fact that they get a little antsy. So making sure people know what those expectations are. Expectations are they want to know what the project is, they want to celebrate. We want celebrations every time we turn into grant. Small ones, you know, everybody come up, let's have a Coke, you know, break out the chocolate, whatever. Go bigger celebrations when we get the grants. <laughs> For these guys, technology is a necessary part of the work environment. Um, what, was the, what was the acronym? BYOD, bring your own device. <laughs> if I can't have my email on my phone, I don't want to carry two phones. Now, some people have to for security, you know, of data, but I don't carry two phones. I handed the company one back and said, oh, thank you, I'll just set up email on my own device because I, I was always losing a charge on something. Um, technology and decent tech is an absolute necessity if you're going to attract and keep millennials. Handing them broken down equipment that is slow and doesn't work. Not having Wi-Fi in your workplace for their own devices. Um, not a good idea. It also tends to make those of us who love technology and who are older a little impatient too. It's like, what do you mean you've got like DSL speeds in here? Yeah. I demand a T1 line. Work ethic. Contrary to what some cynical baby boomers think, this generation does very much have a work ethic. It does not look, however, like a baby boomers. Neither does Gen X. <clears throat> it's getting the job done right, and they value work insofar as it creates results. Exactly what you were saying about wanting to know what the bigger picture is. I'm getting nods from my, from my other millennials in the audience. The work is about the results. Now, as a company owner or manager, you also believe that work is about results, right? It just doesn't historically always look the same. Results for you were, and for me, at an earlier point in my, when I was in banking, were this department does this, and this does this, and the ops department manages the Fed funds back and forth. Thing. This generation wants to know, why am I managing the Fed funds back and forth overnight? How does that relate to our deposits and our loans? Not just get an order from somebody saying, do it. Well, and I see that it's more, even <clears throat> there is a piece about how it fits in, but it's understanding that vision. Mm -hmm. Like, where is the organization going? What does the organization value? Do my values match what the organization's values are? Because then I'll work as many hours as it takes to get it done. Class is over. <laughs> that is the sum total of this. I hope you captured that on the tape because I will want to be writing it down and using some of this. Um, no, you did. You summed it up beautifully. That is exactly what it is. And this, this part of it does not conflict even with the most traditional, traditionalist view of the workplace. You want people who are invested in what you do getting the job done, right? That's what we all need from our workforce. Whatever the job is, whether it's doing home visiting for disadvantaged kids or building parts or customer service, that's what we want. We want people who are on fire to help us achieve our mission. That's what the millennials can bring to you. And that's why I think this is worth spending some time thinking about how this looks at one's own organization. Come on. <coughs> because you know I'm all about that base, about that base. Don't 
sociologists about where this dividing line is. Um, Boston Marathon bombing, Sandy Hook, elementary schools outside. Now, we have metal detectors in upscale Connecticut schools now. Internet texting, cell phones, I am. Uh, this is not the generation that actually uses Facebook except to communicate with parents, <laughs> mainly grandparents, and put pictures up of their babies. We use Facebook, folks. Gen Xers, some millennials are still kind and post things on Facebook. Snapchat, Instagram, what am I missing? Twitter, Twitter. A Twitter, yeah. Twitter. Hmm? Fine. Fine. And it changes. That's the thing. This sort of thing changes all the time. Now, right here is how to get your company on social media. Right here is how to get millennials as customers. Because as they have taken over the workforce, I'm about to show you some graphs on that that came out this spring, they're also increasing their buying power exponentially right now. They are at the stages of their career to their show that you have disposable income, and they are the future of your buying. And if you want to be in the channels where they buy and learn about what they want to buy, you've got to talk to them and use them. Um, I think that's pretty much just a given. One of the things about this group, and millennials too, uh, but this is going to lead me to a greater degree, these people process information at computer-like speeds. I actually have to sit down more and more now and actually read something through and kind of, you know, put my pieces in order. Not this generation. They can process things on the fly like a computer processor. They're quick. We've taught them to be quick. Media has taught them to be quick. They have been processing images and things at speed. Now, when you have to drill down into something, it may take a little work to help a millennial focus on a drill down into deep information. You have to be able to support that and sometimes insist on it. No, I don't need a 30,000 foot view, I actually need the dirt. I need to know what we're gonna do on this project and I need you to go back in the deed records 100 years and figure this out for me. Okay? And so you may need to have a couple support folks in that. <laughs> they want and need information on demand this is the group that isn't crazy about going back to the library and looking at microfiche. Do we even have microfiche anymore? <laughs> even the libraries that they mostly put it all on, on demand. Hyperconnected. This is a terrific read if you haven't um, for anyone, but uh, managers in particular, because you're the ones who are shaping this workplace of 2020. Uh, this is a terrific read. Um, collaborative. Face-to-face, -face, virtual, doesn't matter to these guys. You can you can work across the country. I'm about to hire a millennial. Sorry, you know, guys don't know them yet. But anyway, we're about to make an offer to a millennial who's going to work out of our Manassas office for me, for People Inc. We'll only be together twice a month, but we will talk every day face-to-face -face using technology. It'll be just up and running on the screen, and at any given moment, it's, hey, do you have a second? I have a question. This generation's very comfortable with all right, so here's the thing, and if you don't have it big enough on your slide to read, um, don't worry, again, you can have the presentation and download it. Basically, this is just a quick chart. Given what I've told you about all the groups, none of this should come as any great surprise, of how people like to be rewarded, acknowledged, have me said thanks, communicate to, and what kind of work environment they're like. If you've got a traditionalist, Rewards traditionally have been gold watches, pins, plaques, something to put up on the wall. Not that millennials don't occasionally like those things, but if a millennial, if you really want to reward a millennial, time off. That is Plus, so true. I'm so, Amen. I'm really not, I have incentives in my work where I'm driven, they want to drive me by, you can get extra money if you do this. It does not drive me. I, if you 
want to say you get two extra holiday days off? Man, I'll, uh, that'll drive me further than any station out. Duly noted. Yeah, that's exactly what I'm talking about. So again, thank you for reinforcing because mm -hmm. I only update this material about twice a year. So it's always lovely to hear it in the field. Mm -hmm. I stay on top of it because the employment trends change so fast. Even though this isn't my job anymore, I still am fascinated by the dynamics. Um, so just take a look. Boomers, promotion, recognition, money. They're used to being out front. They want to be out front. They actually want to be the employee of the month. That's great. A millennial isn't going to value that as much. Not that they wouldn't like it. Same things. How to communicate. A traditionalist tends to be face-to-face, -face, formal, and proper. The formal register of your voice, you know. Last names, usually they'll say, call me Joe, but you shouldn't assume it. Boomers collaborate, still formal, but are much, boomers much more used to working in groups. <coughs> Gen X, we're computer oriented. We uh, traditionally like to get emails. Most, uh, most millennials prefer IMs or a text, generally. For preferred modes, I'm getting nods again, okay. Um, most of us tend to prefer an email. For me, if you're communicating with me the way I want to, it's send me up an email, <coughs> okay, you've got 20 minutes. My boomer boss likes me to call over and say, have you got 20 minutes? Because he doesn't always look at his email at all. Mine's up on a second screen at all times. I know they say that's not the best way to be um, productive, but it works for me. Right? So I have my email, and I know if you send me a note, I will do it. But he doesn't. So you call. The worst is voicemail. Please don't leave me voicemail ever. Yes, sir. <laughs> Now, somebody else might say, well, but I don't mind getting a voicemail. Great! Then you learn. I'm just going to make this up, okay? So just bear with me. You leave her a voicemail, and you send her a text or even an email if necessary. Well, and that's says, why in all of my communication, especially, I'll put my email address and my phone. I mean, people are going to leave voicemail, and that's fine, but I try to make That's it, the last thing you catch up on? Yeah, I try to make it apparent that an email would be just lovely. <laughs> well, my voicemail says when I'm out. I'm out, of, I'm out of the office, ladies and gentlemen, I'll return it on my return. Or you can reach out to me by email, which I'll be checking while I'm gone. I'm not calling into my voicemail messages either, and I'm significantly older. Um, basically, the, the, the kicker on this isn't spoil people by giving them this, that, or the other. You just heard it. This is how to motivate a highly educated, wonderful worker. Do you want that? I do on my team. And if you want to be rewarded that way, then I'll find a way to do it. Um, within my company's guidelines, within the rules that we have, I will find ways to make that happen because I want that on my team. Okay? It isn't about, oh, I'm catering to this generation. One could frame it that way. But to me, it's just every generation wants something different. I want to be given what I want to. And so my job often is to help traditionalists and boomers see that we can be flexible within these constraints and then to turn to my millennials and say, we got this much as a concession at this point, now you need to work with me for a while, and once we can show that this works and doesn't impact productivity or confidentiality or any of the things people care about, then we'll take it another step. So there's that interpretation rule again of, here's what we can do right now and we can try to do more, but we have to show people that this new way of thinking about time off or rewards, whatever it is, can work. And you're not going to take a boomer who doesn't believe this at first and convince them overnight. But if you show them, for instance, allowing Facebook in the workplace. Now, that's an old discussion of pretty much done. But when it first came out, a lot of directors, certainly in my network, were, were banning social media from the workplace. We're not going to be allowing any of that Facebook. We're blocking that site. Anybody ever heard somebody say they're going to do that? Because people waste time. They waste time on that social media crap. I heard that occasionally? Yeah. Or said it? Or heard it? Any of these? Ever heard of a water cooler? <laughs> How about a coffee pot in the break room? What about a smoker in the area? People waste time. This is, you know, the corollary to the gun argument. Um, yeah. Um, and this is true. People will always either waste time or find ways to take a break or spend time together, whatever they want to do. The question is, how do they do it? More of your traditionalists and your boomers use the smoking area. More millennials don't smoke. 
and take a brief Facebook bath during the middle of the day <laughs> to keep up with everything, post what they're doing, check in with their colleagues even on things. As long as the person's productivity is at the levels you want and expect, does it matter how they take their personal time? <laughs> well, Media? you expect them to do things after hours or expect them to respond to things after hours, so to expect that you can't respond to personal things during the day is not a realistic expectation. Nice. I hadn't heard it framed that way before either. I mean, very similar that our personal lives bleed into our professional mm -hmm. lives a lot more now. And also, I think that technology and growing up with technology you are more efficient. S small tasks don't take as much time as they used to. So we can, I think that I read something like that um, most jobs can be done in about five to six hours of work a day. And, and this is especially in an office environment. So when you have someone who is there for eight or nine hours a day, then there is downtime for a lot of people, and they just are more comfortable with using using their devices to check social media or whatever. Because then, when they're at home, they'll respond to an email. So, please mm -hmm. overlap. Mm -hmm. It does overlap. Please. I've done a test several years ago, and at that time, I didn't really realize why I was doing it. But I've always been interested in the different generations, and I hired a, a millennial. Mm -hmm to do some data entry for me. I said, now this is very important that it's not wrong because this is important data. And after about an hour, I come back was just to check on her. Mm -hmm. And she was listening to music. Well, mm -hmm. that would just distract me and there'd be all kinds of errors. I went back and checked her work. There were no errors. But it goes back, so you, that can was do, your... you can do different things like that mm -hmm. and still be productive and maybe more productive. I had, I'm seeing a big nod here. Would you like to add something? No, I do, especially on like Monday mornings when I come in and there's a lot of stuff to get put in or that I have to do. I pop one earbud in so I can still hear the phone with the other and it's like you just get in your zone and, and you're done. If I'm not, I'm distracted by this, I look at that, I, it, yeah. Yeah, we're, we're multitaskers. Right. Mm -hmm. So we have to have something happening over here while we're focusing over here. Mm -hmm. I was a baby boomer, I couldn't do that. Yeah, I struggle with it. Which is fine. Yeah, and my daughter, who is recently out of college, um, not the one with the grandbaby, but the other um, was telling me when she was uh, working in late high school years, and I was like, working in front of the TV, this is not cutting it. She's like, Mom, I can't work up in my room. Now, she was also a straight-A student, which she pointed out to me that, <laughs> do you like my grades? I'm like, well, honey, of course, I'm so proud of you. You're doing great. She's like, then don't. Try to tell me how to, how I best study, and I'm like, aha, and that was my, my beginning of my interest in this. Really works. Her brain is now because of the way society works, not just our household, but society. She's wired differently than I am, and that without that multitasking ability, there's she has a very hard time focusing on something. And she was a science major and a, and a science nerd, so she had hard data and you know. I would just say too with the millennials, I think you'll see a parallel with the traditionalists that if you can give them that vision, that you'll get the the, um, the loyalty that you <coughs> look for. But I think it's a fear of a lot of, of employers. I'm going to put in time and effort with this employee and they're just going to up and leave. Mm -hmm. But I think if you can cast that vision, you'll get that loyalty that you're looking for as well. Whereas they won't have any problem leaving if you don't. Mm -hmm. But if you give that to them, you can get that loyalty. Very good point. And that goes too for training. I've, I have actually heard people say, well, we can't afford to train them. You know, a bunch of them are going to get up and leave. And the answer is one that I think Steve Jobs gave someone, which is, can we afford to not train them? Um, so one of my favorites. Stop the gender racism. Knock it off. Quit calling them names. Quit calling them names. You know, the reality is, is people really want the same things. And that's the closing slide, so I won't jump to it yet. This is the current workforce. <clears throat> By 2030, millennials are not, they're already ahead. This may, this may actually happen sooner now than 2030, um, because the millennials have already now are leading in the workforce numbers. 
we, we have a good relationship. It's because as he was growing up, in a different time as you went through, a lot of times I was asking him, why? Why do you do that? Why are you acting like this? Now, I provided him the wisdom that he needed to grow up, mm -hmm. okay, that he didn't have. But he had some perspectives on life, and he had some changes in his culture that I could learn from. It wasn't wrong, mm -hmm. but I wanted to learn from that. And I think we take that analogy or take that attitude into the workforce, all the generations, mm -hmm. and learn from each other. It's like you said, everybody wants to be respected. And the key word is why. Why do you act like that? Why do you do it that way? Mm -hmm. I want to know. I mm -hmm. genuinely want to know so mm -hmm. I can understand. And I think if people had that spirit of inquiry, mm -hmm. we can face some of the boomer millennial knockdowns that I have seen and yeah. that I'm sure many of us have, have witnessed on occasion um, and have that happening. So I think the tone is everything. And I think you've done it, you, you clearly did it right with your son. Because there's two ways to ask that question. One is, so why, so why is that important to you? Why, why do you want to do that? And then there's the other one. So why are you doing that? <laughs> Think about it. There's a world of difference in asking that question two different ways. And I think you put your finger on it. And you're right. This generation, they're going to change. They're changing the world. Mm -hmm. They are. Mm -hmm. In very, very cool ways. The millennial dad in Paris who posted the Facebook thing that went viral, you can't make me angry. He lost his wife, the mother of their 17-month-old child. He's like, you will not cause me to hate. I think it was not cause me to hate. You've broken my heart and everything else, but you can't make me hate. That's this generation in a nutshell. And we have the power inherent to help support these changes, and we have the passionate folks who are willing to put in that time. Whether it's personal or professional, whether it's about increasing um, our satisfactions in home and families or increasing our productivity and bottom line on the job, it all boils down to making the workplace a welcoming spot for all of us, mm -hmm. uh, which is a terrible platitude to end with in a cliche. Mm -hmm. But simply asking people what they want, how do they best like to be rewarded, and what do they need goes a tremendous way toward making this work. Any other questions? I'll just add a comment. I'm uh, in the field. Well, I'm the executive director of an organization. Amongst the meetings I go to, I'm the youngest in the room by about 10 years. And I hear over and over and over again complaints about the millennials. And I'm sitting there going, we're not all bad. We have good things to bring. But I hear people complaining, and oh, my son does this. And it's just complaints, complaints, complaints. And I hear, well, they go into the job interview, and they want another salary. And and they go up to the frontline manager and try to talk to, and they think they say all these things negatively about the millennial generation that we're doing this and this and this wrong. But to us, it's not wrong. We just think differently. Mm -hmm. I go to the I might go to the frontline manager because I was I was not, but millennials were raised by parents who were their friends, mm -hmm. and there was not that line of I, you're the authority and I'm the child. It's helicopter parents and we're best friends and. You know, so just because we do things differently doesn't mean necessarily we're being disrespectful or, or it's wrong. It's just the way we were raised, the world we were raised in is very different. We asked the salary in the interview because that's an important part of making the decision for us. You know, mm -hmm. we have a lot to bring to the table. I've got offers on the table. That's an important part for me. And, and, and I would reiterate that we like uh, feedback. Mm -hmm. Feedback is so, so important. I work for a board of directors who are all manufacturers, plant managers, they're extremely busy. And I'm always sitting over here going, do you hate me? Do you like me? Am I doing awful? Am I doing well? And I, I recently talked to the chair of my board, and he said, you know, we really need to do better about that. I said, I get no feedback from you guys. I don't know how I'm doing. You know, I, I try do to more of this, do less of right, that. Right, right. And he goes, you know, that's just how we are. We don't tend to make time for feedback. And that's so important for us. And from their perspective, no feedback means you're doing fine. Keep right. it up. But that's not what it means to you. To me, it's like, oh, gosh, yeah, I could be messing everything up. So feedback is so, so important. I mean, even in, I'm, I'm kind of old-fashioned. I like a handwritten note or, or something that I can touch, look at, or, mm -hmm. or see. But, you know, even simple and as simple as taking five minutes to send an email and say, hey, I like the way you did this this week. That was great. Good job. That, that gives me, okay, I can go on next week knowing that I'm doing the right mm -hmm. thing. Whereas next week, I might go in going, 
do I keep doing this? I don't know. Maybe I should try something else because they haven't said anything. Well, and that's a great thing. It sounds like the way that you're modeling is say, telling your, your board chair, which who is your direct contact in the DD, mm -hmm. is here's what I need to be successful. Mm -hmm. You know, help me by giving me this. Mm -hmm. Being able to communicate that in a way that doesn't say, look, you old farts, you guys are stuck in the 1960s. <laughs> and if you don't get out of this soon, I'm going to walk. Mm -hmm. um, I'm also, the way I think is, I'm not just going to be okay with something being wrong. I'm going to do something to fix it. Mm -hmm. It's not just okay that this system is wrong. I was <coughs> raised with, I have the ability to change it. So if I have an issue and I go to my supervisor and say, this isn't, I don't like the way this is being done, this is wrong. It's not because I'm trying to be disrespectful, or, but it's because if I think something's wrong, mm -hmm. I feel like I have the ability to make a change and make a difference. Mm -hmm. Not that I feel disrespectful towards you. Which can be seen and <coughs> as very threatening by a traditional manager. And again, it's a question of asking, why are you saying it, how? And as millennials get more work experience, knowing which ones are the hot buttons and which ones are the low-hanging fruit to fix. So, so let's say you have two or three generations in one group, mm -hmm. and there's conflict. Mm -hmm. And nobody's wrong, mm -hmm. and nobody's right. So, so, you know, just talk about conflict resolution in a group like that. Um, I generally approach it, and again, this is, it, it depends entirely on what, who, what's going on and which generations and who's got the beef. But in general terms, it helps to clarify why people are conflicting. Is to reach for that underlying, not just, and I'm going to oversimplify wildly, that you think we should have peas for the lunch and you think we should have carrots for the lunch and you're demanding a vegetarian option, you know, with the beef or whatever. It's to say, okay, so, let's use your example. There's a system that's not working for you and you want it fixed. And you're in a group, the middle manager is like, well, but we've done it this way for ages and it's worked for everybody else. And you're, what's really going on there is you see something that's not up to modern sort of speed. They see a possibly cherished practice that you're threatening. I think it almost always calls for somebody forgive me, but I'm going to say this, to be the grown-up in the situation mm -hmm. and practice a little transactional analysis and say, okay, so what I'm hearing you say is that our process for doing expense reimbursement, whatever it is, yeah, is hampering your ability to get paid. We don't pay you enough to ask you to hold on to that couple of hundred bucks you know, every few weeks. And the way that we've always done it, which has worked really well in the past for people who had credit cards and credit lines, whatever. So what can we do now to... Um, use this great system that we have and meet these needs. And it's, a, it's work. It's work because what you have to figure out is what's the actual problem. Because right. the conflict is usually, not always, it's usually not just because a millennial is getting on a boomer's nerves or vice versa. Usually there's something and somebody's feeling either unheard or threatened. Mm -hmm. That's been my experience is that one or the other, and often both in the same conversation. And what you have to do is get the one person to listen and get the other person sometimes to tone down a bit and say, okay, here's what we're really looking at and recast the discussion. And sometimes if you've done this um, you know, with staff, you could point out that what we're seeing here is some generational conflict and they go, oh, yeah, yeah, that is this. And you can do it. So feel free to use this um, yourselves if you think it would be helpful. I find that the more people understand about generational conflict, the more able they are to self-regulate you know, well, our, no one wants to feel old. Like they don't want to feel like, you know, I mean, if you're a baby boomer or a traditionalist, you don't want to feel like you don't get it. <laughs> so, I mean, even I feel that way with the with the next generation that's coming up. You don't want to feel like you're you don't get it or you don't understand it. So, you, you know, there's that. And especially with boomers who definitely don't want to be old <laughs> in any way. There's there's incentive to want to understand that and to, <laughs> to, to get what. And, and so I, I agree that communication is key, but I have one more question Please. about that. So what if you have somebody in the crowd that won't acknowledge that there's a problem? Because we all experience that on occasion. So what do you do with that? In the great words of Drucker and, uh, what's his name, Collins from Good to Great, get him off the bus. Build them the, am I still on camera? I'm sorry. <laughs> Can you tell I like to engage with people right where they are? 
Um, even when I did this one time for a group of like 400 um, for a keynote, I we got a lapel mic because they knew they couldn't ask me to stay up. I just don't do well with that. Um, but that's my Gen X thing. Just to, you know, how it goes. I find um, it's come up a few times. Usually somebody in a person of authority to that person has to have a little bit of a come to Jesus meeting. Um, now, not always, maybe education will work, but if somebody is absolutely dug in their heels and refusing to budge, um, generally somebody with some level of either moral or direct authority kind of has to step in and say, listen, it, again, you're not wrong, but this isn't working. This, and point out that it's not getting you what you want. And I think that's, it's all about self-interest in this instance. It's, it's about people getting the job done, and if you dig in your heels, the job's not getting done, and digging in your heels isn't making it get done any faster. So what can I do to help smooth this? And then maybe a conversation with, if it's a generational issue, I'm just gonna turn over here and say, go to the millennial and say, listen, I am working hard to help move this immovable object. I need some help. Could, for the next couple of group meetings, could we pick one thing and could we couch it like this? You'll find your millennials are pretty eager in general to work with that and will feel really empowered as a team member when you point out that they have some power to help change this person's attitude to do it. But I do think it often takes a, listen, this isn't working. We're not getting the outcome we need. It's not about you being right or wrong. But it can be tough. And in the final analysis, sometimes it's up building their own silo and let them do their thing inside it and have everybody work around them if there's somebody you can't move. Which is a last ditch, and I hate to ever say that that's how to do it. But once in a while, some people just need silos. Other questions or thoughts? And please don't forget to do your evaluations. I know they're very important. I saw them on the tables. I always ask for copies. And I have a rule about evaluation. If you say anything was average, that's great, and you don't have to make a comment. If you loved something, or if you hated something, you have an obligation to note down a couple of words about that, so we can do more of what's good and less of what's not. Uh, I'd like to plug someone, uh -huh. a good friend of mine, she's a millennial, and uh, her mission in life is to help people understand this topic. Mm -hmm. She's written a book, she does, she'll come into your business. Is she here say, locally? Yeah, she's in Bristol, oh, Tennessee. I'd love to meet her. And mm -hmm. uh, uh, she'll come into your business, your church, or organization, or anything, and do seminars, and, and, and the whole whole thing to help people understand. So I'll be glad to give her information to her contact Yeah, please, maybe you can send it to you, you know, yeah, right it on make it that. available. Right on that. Because, yeah, sometimes it does take someone else coming in. Because really, <coughs> to, did you learn that much that was new in terms of material today? I doubt it. What I'm hoping you learn is a way to maybe put it together and help it work for you. It wasn't a trick question to ask if I taught well or not, by the way. That was just a, most people know this kind of thing. What they don't do is put it all together and use it to make change. So I hope you can. Please go to contact. If there's somebody who's doing this on a consulting basis and you've got a decent workforce, it's a great thing to bring somebody in for. And it's always a fun thing. So really? thank you for having thank me. Thank you. And uh, Randy Gale and the Southwest Virginia Alliance for Manufacturing actually sponsored um, the lunch today. And so I'm going to let Lindy Gale say a, a word or two. Thank you. Um, we are SPAM. Uh, it's an organization that supports manufacturing in Southwest Virginia. Um, we do a lot of different things in the region. Um, I won't give my normal plug because do we have any manufacturing? I know somebody from Iconic Technologies is here today. Is that true? No, they registered. We don't have any manufacturers in the room, so I won't do my sales pitch, but I will tell you, we do a lot of things um, to help manufacturers in the region, and I really wish this room was filled with manufacturers because it's mostly the manufacturers that are scratching their head going, I don't know how to retain millennials. They spend $7,500 per person in training, and that person heads out the door a month later. Why? Come here, come learn. And I love your presentation. Very interactive, very interesting. I'm just... I feel, I feel made me happy. I'm so tired of hearing, getting beat down by being a millennial. Um, I think an important part is understanding each other and why we do things, not just you're doing it and that's wrong. Um, but thank you all for coming. Um, we do a lot of things for manufacturing, do some employment placement. 
Um, and if you'd like to learn more about our organization, feel free to contact me. And Sandy Ralph wants to talk to you a little just, bit just about wait, our upcoming wait, project. Just want to remind you, we're taking a Christmas holiday break. We're going to help Santa Claus do some um, building of uh, presents and so forth. So we won't be doing any new knowledge sessions during December, but on January the 20th, we start back, and it's going to be timely because our next session will be on developing procedures and policies for business. So you've talked about how to manage uh, your your personnel and employees, but now how you put it in writing and protect your, yourself as, an, as a company, but also your employees. And then on the second note, um, uh, after the holidays, we're having something that will be our third year. It's a Washington County Business Challenge, and we're excited this year because we even have more money. We have $25,000 to help a business in Washington County, the towns of Abington, Blade Spring, and Damascus to launch or grow businesses. And if you know someone, or if you're interested in launching a business, or if you know someone that has an existing business and they're, they're, they can't expand because they don't have the capital, I encourage them to participate in the Washington County Business Challenge. Applications are due the 13th of uh, January. It will get underway here on January the 26th through March the 1st. Every um, once a week from 6 till 8.30 or 9, there will be classes that will help you build those skills. Um, and then you will pitch that business idea, kind of like Shark Tank, to a group of judges. You also turn in a business plan. And that business plan will be probably about 75% of what you're graded on. And we'll have judges that are outside the regions that will review those uh, business plans and be awarding that, those um, opportunities. So Washington County is starting a <coughs> standard in Virginia um, and, and the towns because most of them are going out looking for grant money to do these challenges. The communities here are investing locally in the helping folks get business. So that's why I'm excited about it. And I challenge each of you to either take a flyer in the back, put it up in your business, share it with a friend, but help us um, help someone start uh, 2016 on a, on a good note. And we all need these opportunities within the community. So thank you. And, to, and if somebody or you just talk to somebody and they want to start or expand their business, they can contact the Washington County Chamber of Commerce mm -hmm. for the application. And uh, it's all uh, online. Yeah. Yeah, we're really excited because Glade Springs, a, a new business in Glade Springs this year gets 5000 A new business in Damascus this year gets 5000 And then um, any business in the rest in Washington County gets the other 15000 So hopefully the week, this will be our third challenge. The last two <coughs> have produced 14 new businesses and expanded eight. So we're... we're Pretty excited about this. We have probably one of the most successful challenges in the in the region. So, so help spread the, the love around, okay? Yeah. And thank you. We had about 30 viewing today online with us. We had some technical issues. Sorry about that. But thanks for joining us. And uh, happy Thanksgiving and Merry Christmas to everybody. <laughs>